so parallelism shootout threads multiple processes async io uh, just to set the expectation before i start this is not a deep dive into any of these um, so definitely not an advanced talk probably intermediate maybe even beginner to intermediate depending on your you know, how, how much you know about uh, them so my name is Sharyar. i'm a software engineer in london uh, working at ospa and i don't have a presentation because it quit unexpectedly <laughs> Uh, today we're going to talk about parallelism and the point of it is to uh, take one problem, it will come on the slide eventually, um, and try and approach solving it using different techniques, I, um, threading, multiprocessing or uh, async IO and just get a feel for how each of them work. That's me. Um, we want to take this problem that we have. So we have, let's say, lots of URLs in a file, and we want to download their content and store it on our machine, right? Um, and the point of it is to use the threading, multiprocessing, and async I/O libraries or modules um, separately, and then uh, firstly get a feel for the mechanics of how they work, and secondly to be able to do a simple benchmark. Now benchmarks may make me nervous, especially for parallelism, so don't take it too seriously. It's just to give you an idea or and me an idea of how they compare to each other. Um, so before we start, I'm just going to break down the problem into three main bits. So the first is that we're going to read the URLs from a file. The second part is to download it from the internet. And the third one is to store it on our machine. Right? But before we begin, just a quick reminder. Who is familiar with I.O. bound and CPU bound types of computation? Excellent. Uh, just a quick recap, CPU bound are basically computations that are hungry for CPU. So if you give them more CPU or faster CPU, they perform faster and they end quicker. And I.O. bound computations are ones that the time it takes for them to complete, it depends how long they're waiting for I.O. So you can give them a really fast CPU, but it won't make a difference because it's blocking on I.O. So to go back to our three original sub problems, um, reading URLs from a file, I.O. bound, right? Because this access, we're reading it. Downloading content, I.O. bound, HTTP request, again, we have to block and wait. And storing the content on our machine, again, we're writing to disk, so that's I.O. bound too. And just as a random thing, generally a lot of things we do are I.O. bound, um, for a weird definition of generally, but usually day-to-day -day tasks are, are I.O. bound. Uh, before we even parallelize, though, I think it would be good to just quickly go through the sequential approach. And I think that would be a good baseline to compare how much actually parallelizing it improves it and how different methods um, ha have, have different improvements. So a bit of a mouthful. Um, I've put the whole thing on there because you can actually run this and it works. Um, interesting, the highlighted bit for the sequential approach, you know, we go over the URLs. Those um, functions are just for convenience so that I don't have to write a lot of things again, but they do what they say they do. So we go over the URLs, we get the content, and we put it on a machine. But we do this sequentially. So we do one, we do the next one. And when we're thinking about tasks, or when I think about tasks, and if I want to make them faster, I would have to think about, so how does this look on my CPU over time, right? So the way this looks is that the, it's only running on one of the cores. Let's say we have two cores. Uh, say, as far as I'm concerned, second core is skiving, right? Because it's doing its own stuff. But as far as my task is concerned, it's not doing anything. Um, so I'm doing a bit of work getting the URL, downloading it, storing it on a machine, and doing the next one. You know, just continues like that. Um, but to even be more accurate, what's actually happening is that we're doing a tiny fraction of CPU work. Then we're doing nothing, which is the dotted lines, because we're blocking for I.O. Uh, CPU is not doing anything, and then we do a tiny amount more CPU work. But the reality, this is not actually to scale. So if I was to show it to scale, the bit where the CPU for this particular task is actually engaged is very, very small, right? So this is a proper I/O bound task. And just to show how this works over multiple URLs, so we can like one URL takes a tiny amount of time, thirty URLs takes a lot more time. By the way, in the beginning, I said. The problem statement is that we have lots and lots of URLs. Um, I've just used 30 in this case because it was much easier to 
like run it multiple times, but imagine this over a gazillion URLs, right? It's not gonna happen with sequential approach. Um, but it's good, to, you know, it just predictably goes up linearly. Um, so threading is the first method we're gonna use. Um, threads in Python are actual re real threads. Also, there's no controversy in this. I'm not gonna talk about the global interpreter lock or fix it or it's just there. It's not, that's not gonna happen. Um, but just so we know, threads are actual P threads or Windows threads or whatever. They're, they're real threads, right? Um, and quick recap on how to make them. Is everyone familiar with how to use threads? Okay, fair enough. So quickly we can make them two ways. Either subclass threading the thread um, and override the run method or just have a function and use the like normal thread class pass it as the target and let it uh, do the work. Uh, to run the threads, it's just called the start method, not the run method. Um, call the start method and it goes and does its stuff. And it stops when your actual function, so in the left case, the run method, and in the right one, the actual do work function, it, the thread stops when that function has reached the end, right? But what if that function never reaches the end? What if we have a while true in it? So we want it to do constantly work. Then we have demonic, demonic threads. So we pass a daemon equals true to the constructor, and that tells it that you, can, you will stop whenever the main thread stops. So when the main thread stops, that will stop. Otherwise, the interpreter will lock if we don't, because the main thread stops, but everyone else is still running. It's confusing. The threading code, again, this is the full code, so I don't usually like putting lots of code, but this is it. So I thought it would be cool to go through it uh, one by one. First and foremost, we add URLs to queue. I didn't mention the queue. We need the queue so that different threads can talk to each other. Um, not talk to each other, actually. Different threads can use something to get their, what they want to do next, right? Um, again, Python just gives this to you. Uh, most of you probably know this. Uh, it's thread safe. We don't have to worry about it. You just create it at the top, unvisited URLs. First thing I do, I go and add the URLs to the queue so that our threads can then consume from it. Um, you get an interesting case if you do that in separate thread too. You don't want to do that because your, thread, your queue might never get full and threads might read from it and then they think it's empty and your program ends, but it's not actually empty. Um, so then we go, we have a number of workers, let's N. We go through them, for each of them we create one thread. Um, give it the target function, which is visit URLs, basically does what the sequential version did. It literally does that, except it gets the URL and it marks it as task done, which is what you do on a queue, queue to say the task is done. Uh, so we create the worker threads and we start them, right? And that does the actual work. That's it. And to go back to how my CPU and my time is looking, this would look something like that. Uh, this is not accurate, but if we had three threads, then you would have three threads. Um, <laughs> um, and one, once one of them has, has done with CPU and is waiting, well, we can go to the next one but it's I'm being very vague here, you know, the OS or you know, someone decides it's gonna move on. And so in the same amount of time, we make better use of our resources. We do a lot more work, right? And the yellow thing there is the global interpreter lock, which we shall not talk about any more after this. But that's just to say, if the lock just makes sure there's only one thread being run on a core at a particular time, right? So again, our second core is skiving, it's doing nothing. And to look at the speed and the performance of this approach, um, this is how it works. The, the x-axis, we have number of threads. So if we have one thread, it takes ages. It takes, it should probably even take more than this sequential version because there's a bit of overhead. Um, by one thread, I mean not the main thread, I mean one extra thread created after the main thread. Uh, but we'll see that as we create more and more threads, this goes down. However, um, it does flat out after, I don't know, in this case, maybe between like 11 to 17 threads. Um, you're not really getting any more advantage. And that makes sense because, the, you know, by the time the 17th thread, thread comes up, there might not even be any 
things left for it to do, right? But this is only for 30 URLs. If we had a gazillion URLs, then that would flatten out a bit later. Um, and so, okay, this is good. We have reduced the time, probably, I think sequential took about 30 or so seconds. We've gone down to, what, at a good case, about five seconds, so that's okay. Um, but we want to try multiprocessing now, see, see how that would perform. Um, multiprocessing, again, I assume most people are familiar. Hands up. Yay. Um, it, with multiprocessing, we perform processes, like actual processes, right? So they can um, just run on separate cores. And the cool part about it is that the API is very, very similar to threading, as in very similar. <laughs> so it sidesteps the interpreter lock. Oh, I said I won't mention that again. Um, this is, I promised the last time. And it's really easy to change our threading example to be a multiprocessing example. And to do that, this is the exact threading code. It's only the highlighted lines are changed, right? So instead of getting Q from threading, we get it from the multiprocessing module. And instead of a thread, we create a process. That's it. Everything else is the same. This is beautiful, right? So I just changed that in five seconds. Um, but the multiprocessing also gives something else, amongst many other things. That's something that I'm going to talk about here, which is the pool object. Now, the pool object is a way to parallelize execution of a function over a number of arguments. Right? So what this allows us to do is to, instead of changing our threading kind of code, to use multiprocessing. We can even change our sequential code to, to use multiprocessing. And again, this is the sequential code, uh, as, as I showed you on the one of the first slides. All you change is that you read the URL in advance, and you create a pool, and that pool will have a map method. And what the map does, it takes a function and a list of arguments, but not a list of arguments for one call to that function. Every time it calls the function, it gives one of those items in the list to it, and it says, do your thing. And you can give it the number of worker processes that you expect. So to go back to the time and CPU kind of usage, uh, if we had two processes, this is hopefully how, how it would look, assuming that they would actually get scheduled to run on two separate cores. Um, but the idea is that this should, multiprocessing should allow you to sidestep the, you know, and <laughs> be able to run it properly in parallel, so true parallelism, uh, hopefully. Um, yeah. And if we had more and more processes, then this is not accurate, but this is how it would look. It's like having two of those threading things. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's the same, it looks the same as the other graph. Uh, but again, this is not exactly accurate um, because it's processes. But you, you get much more work done and you have lots of more cores to uh, annoy. And the performance, um, very similar to threading in terms of the way it reduces your number of tasks. But uh, first and foremost, for just one single, if you have one single process, it takes longer than both sequential and threading because the overhead is a lot um, to create the process. Um, the thread is a bit less than sequential compared to this, it's nothing. Uh, but again, you get a healthy drop. Um, this was again used for 30 URLs, so after a certain point, you know, it's diminishing returns, it's not really doing much. Um, so that's cool too. But async IO, right? I think async IO is to Python as big data is to middle management. I don't know, I think it's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I think it's kind of, woo, async IO. It's a, it's a new module where in Python 3.4, um, and it gives you the infrastructure for writing single thread of code uh, concurrently. Um, it is meant to be quite low level, and the point is that you can use other stuff like Tornado and Twisted on top of it. Uh, I don't in this presentation, but uh, it is quite low level, and it, it's fairly compatible with everything else. Um, well, except, you know, it's Python 3.4 mainly. And I'm just gonna, is everyone, is anyone familiar with async IO? Cool. Um, so I'm gonna go through, async IO has a lot of concepts. Um, I'm going to go through a 
like two of them, just because they're, I think they're like the most important ones. And also those are the ones that I'll be using in the code later on. Um, one of them is that we have coroutines. And coroutines are basically functions that can pause their execution in the middle of what they're doing, return, you know, something else does its work, and then you can go back to that function and carry on. So this should immediately remind you of yield, basically. It's like a generator, right? Because it keeps its state, you do something, it yields, you do something else. But then if you go back to it, then it continues from where it was and it keeps its state. These are what coroutines are. Um, and the way they are used is that if you have three separate functions and you want to run them in a row, you run one, then you run the next one, then you run the third one. Whereas with coroutines, you can say, okay, I'm going to run the first one until it needs to block. When it needs to block, well, you can yield. I can do my own stuff. I can run the second function. And then it does, does it the same way. I mean, I, can, I think this demonstrated well, where it does it in a row of three separate functions. But if you take the case of blue, you know, it suspends because it's blocking. So it gives a chance for other things to run. But they also suspend too halfway through. And when blue carries on, it's just making progress. Um, it's not that it's starting again. It's just now it's stopped blocking. It's ready to go again so it can make pro pro progress. But, and also notice that these are not run in the same order, round up and stuff. Uh, the order changes. So someone needs to keep track of you know, how are the schedules and generally just keep track of all these coroutines going around. And that's where the event loop comes in. The event loop is in charge of keeping track of the coroutines. That's mainly the thing it does. And uh, deciding which one's gonna go next. Um, I ran through this much quicker than I did last night when I tried this one. <laughs> okay, anyway. So the code for using async IO looks like this. Um, yield from is new. Um, it's similar to, uh, we don't talk about it, but yield from basically allows you a two-way channel of communication. And what it does is that usually when you just do a yield, um, like a generator, um, it just turns something. Whereas yield from allows you to kind of refactor your generator out of your generator. It sounds weird, it probably doesn't make sense. Just don't worry about it. Delegation. <laughs> delegation. Yeah, delegation. It does that too. Um, so just to walk through what's happening here. First we get all our core routines. So it do work as a core routine, basically, you know, a function that suspends halfway through, blah blah blah. Um, we first create all of them with all our URLs. Um, then we need an event loop. So from uh, async IO, we can get an event loop. And then the, the run and complete, uh, run and full complete method allows you to pass it a bunch of coroutines or futures or whatever, in this case, coroutines. And it will run them, all of them, until they're complete. And I don't async IO that wait there because I want to actually wait for everything to be uh, completed first. And the way do work, um, works is that we first need to get the content of the URL. So at this point, this is fairly IOE, right? So it yields from async I, uh, it yields from get URL content, which again, th there's a lot of blocking there. So we can, while we're waiting for it, wait, waiting for it to happen, we can just go back and run like the next task, and that would be okay. By the way, there's a lot of different ways of writing this task. I was trying to make the shortest possible one so I can fit all of it in one slide. Um, but this is kind of how it works. And then you the, the get URL, it, it, it has yield, so halfway through, if it's blocking, it can just, other stuff can carry on and do their work. And the performance of this looks pretty cool. So with number of URLs, it's pretty quick, right? Um, and I think what's really cool about it is that the the, the kind of line that it increases as you add more URLs is less steep than it was, let's say, in sequential case. Um, so this is quite promising. Drum roll for a winner. Um, I'm just going to put all the four different approaches that I used. Um, well, sequential, I'm counting that as one, next to each other. Um, to see how they performed for 30 URLs again. 
not a good idea, which is the whole point of doing stuff like this. But we can see sequential is just not going to happen. Um, and threading multiple signals in sync IO, they are all fairly good. I tried running this on a lots and lots of more URLs, and async IO did outperform properly in this case. Um, but again, these are, you have to take them with a pinch of salt because they are very dependent on the tasks that you're doing. For IO bound tasks, it, you can use threading, you can use async IO, and that's fine. But if this was a CPU bound task, threading wouldn't stand a chance because of, you know. Um, and <laughs> async IO, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't do that well either, as far, as, far as I understand it. Um, so multiprocessing would be the answer. So this, I'm tempted to conclude here, but I don't like making conclusions when it comes to parallelism. I think the whole point of it is every single task, every time I've come across a separate task, it's just different. You have to look at how is it, diff, you know, is it IO bound, is it CPU bound, but how IO bound is it actually? So it's not, I don't, I don't you know, I can't make a conclusion and say, well, use coroutines always or async IO or whatever. I think you have to be pragmatic about the task that you have at hand and just play with it a bit to see which one works well. So I'm definitely not going to say, I wouldn't use this slide to say, oh, async IO is much better. No, it's not. Um, it, it really depends on what you're doing um, and the type of competition you're doing. So this was meant to be a half an hour talk. I don't know why it's 20 minutes and 48 seconds, but this is it. Um, sorry <laughs> to disappoint. <laughs> Just, just to waste another minute, um, I please, uh, if you want to give me feedback, um, other than your talk was too quick, um, anything else, <laughs> please get in touch. We can talk about it. Um, if you want to try other stuff with my code and some other resources, I've put together some great links and videos of stuff that will be on, uh, on that URL on GitHub right after this talk. I'll do it when I get out there. Um, it's there, I just have to make it public. Um, yeah, this is it, really. QNPA. We have a bit of time of questions. We have time for like 4,000 questions. <laughs> so, did you ever do something crazy like combine these techniques, have multiprocesses that run threads and use async IO in the threads? So, the idea for this talk, initially when I proposed it, was that to at the end do something like that. Um, but then I didn't have time. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't realize that I would have like 12 minutes of you know, doing crazy stuff. So no, I didn't. Um, sorry. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was uh, very interesting, quite uh, concise. Yeah. Uh, there's something that true. <laughs> it's a quality. There's something that really puzzles me. If you, can you please show again the slides with um, the threading of the multiprocessing time? I really don't understand why when you have one, I don't know, one thread, it takes, uh, we'll see the number, I don't Sorry, know. Sorry, one sec. This one okay? You want the diagram? The, the, the times, please. Let's check this out. Um, the next one, I think. Oh, so, or what, whichever the processor, the next one, there's a, oh, yeah. this one, yeah. I really don't understand when we have one process, it takes more than 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, so. What did I do wrong? Or did no, 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 it did. This is one process for 30 URLs, right? It does, it, I mean, so, okay. right? Okay. So in the sequential version, if you have, if you want to download 30 URLs, this is basically sequential. So each URL takes roughly about one second, just under. Okay. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you scared me there for a second. <laughs> no. I thought I got my axes wrong. <laughs> okay, no, okay, got it. Thank you. Guys, we can talk about life too if you've run out of questions because we have another 15 minutes. About, about the life and everything 42, but besides that, uh, what about uh, G event yes. and green threads? So you can use stuff like G events on top of async uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I haven't done it. So uh, you can definitely use it. You can, like, 
tornado twisted everything. Um, that was, I think, the the way Syncari was designed was for it to be for other frameworks like that to be able to build on top of it. That's why it's quite low level. Um, but I don't have any chart performances for it. What I can do, however, if you're interested, if anyone else is, I can do that, add it to slides, and when I put the slides online, it could be included. Is that, is that okay? So I'll do that. That would be great. Okay, yeah, I'll do it. G event does not run on top of async IO. There it's, we go. It's, it's its own event loop. It's it's completely different. I'm wrong. <laughs> um, okay. Well, yeah, I I have to look into that. Yeah. yeah, it's not right. But but I was under the impression you can use them together. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was just saying that, that you, you said Gvent, Tornado, and Twisted. So Gvent uh, um, does not fit in there, but Tornado and Twisted definitely do. So they can run on top of AsyncIO. But Gvent is a really thing that, you know, is, is more yeah, yeah. Low level and yeah. does its own way of uh, Dealing disputing yeah, yeah. work. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Correction, you can't run Gvent on top of AsyncIO. Ah, uh, okay, good to know. I just wanted to make sure everyone's <laughs> on the same page here. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, Good, you're paying attention at yeah, least. Not, not a, that I have the micro anyway, uh, sorry. Uh, so one thing to add, um, you presented yield from as the way to do um, delegation in AsyncIO. Uh, so Python 3.5 will have a new syntax for yeah. that, uh, which was used, no, it was changed before because there were problems with yield, yield from and mixing them with generators, and so generators don't work, but coroutines do, and so that was all a bit of a mess. And so there's new syntax now that goes um, uh, coroutines are defined with async def. There's new syntax for defining coroutines. And then instead of yield from, inside of such a coroutine, you would use a wait yeah. instead of yield from. So I had, yeah, I had actually opened a post in the resources to show you uh, kind of Guido's response to why he chose yield from and how that didn't happen. Uh, but that's, that's also in the resources. It's a good read. He, you know, just goes through why it shows you from and not a wait, and then, as you mentioned, you know, the move. <coughs> Guys, we have at least 20 more minutes. Yeah, I think. Uh, no, just so, something very quick. What about uh, memory overhead? Because I have been pushing processes can, or even threads can take much more memory than async IO, for example. Uh, yeah, they can. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, but, but again, I don't want to, I really get nervous when I have to do a conclusion like that, though. Yes, they do, but I think you have to look at your task, too, uh, to see what it does. But yeah, I mean, they do. So. Um, about the overheads, did you happen to get a chance of testing something here, like, say, a four-core hyper-threading processor for the multiprocessing? I didn't. Um, maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> Might yeah. be interesting to see. I feel like I've disappointed a lot of people today by not doing all this. <laughs> that is, time is finite. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah, do it. Do you know what? That's great. I want to put this code up. Well, it is up. I want to make it public. And like, just feel free to contribute. And then next year, I'll do the same talk, and it can take longer. <laughs> Any more questions? Lunchtime? Yes. Thank you very much.